It's nice to see Jane. Thank you. Okay, Jules, 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 we're live right now. So, um, so the audience, so, so the audience, we're, we're, um, we're waiting just a couple minutes here. Uh, uh, Richard had a little technical difficulty. So Richard Close will be logging on in just a second here, and then we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, so appreciate everyone's patience and um, we will, there he is. Okay, perfect. Richard, you want to unmute yourself and take over the meeting? Bob, you want to unmute him? Okay. Okay, everybody else, please mute yourself on the board. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association uh, October meeting. Hope everyone is doing well um, under the circumstances. So we have a number of things we want to cover this evening. Uh, we'll start out with Bob. Is there technical information that the people should uh, understand? Richard, I think we're all good. Welcome everyone. I uh, just wanted to pass on to people that we will not be doing live Q&A tonight. We ask the public to submit questions uh, by email prior to the debate. And we received so many that we're, uh, we're not gonna be doing all of those even, there's so many. So uh, the Q&A box is there, but if you submit questions, we're not gonna be able to do anything with them tonight. But uh, I think you're going to find it a really great debate. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce the board of directors. And if they have anything they want to add, this is a great time to do it. We'll do it alphabetically. We'll start with Matt. Unmute yourself uh, and tell us who's sitting behind you. I have nothing to add. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Jane Kaplan. Hi. Of how many years? Oh my goodness, I thought I had nothing. Uh, we, 30 years. No. Oh, well, okay. 30 years, okay. Uh, no, nine uh, participants. You have to put that on the. Okay, uh, next is um, Jules. Yes, hello everybody. Okay, this is Jules Fear. I have an announcement to make to everybody concerning the toy drive that we have each year. And we will not have a toy drive this year, which we do every year at Gelson's. Instead, we're going to have a virtual toy drive, which means we will be asking people to send a check or use um, PayPal for the Ch Department of Children and Family Services. So we're asking that you make out a check to that company, that organization, send it to SOHA, and we will then give it to them. And they will purchase the toys for the kids, which we have done every year for the last many, many years. 21 years, 21 years. 21 years. This is okay. a very important year for, for everybody this year. It's a difficult year. So we're asking everybody to reach into their pockets, send a check in, and let's support these kids that are under the okay. um, well, under the care of the Department of Children and Family Services and are in need of this voice. Okay, so we're not asking for the money right now. Uh, it, the full information will be in, in the newsletter, but the concept is that we'll be collecting checks payable to the county Department of Family Services, presenting them to the Van Nuys office and they will buy the toys for the kids. So that's the concept and more information in the, in the newsletter. Okay, next, Tom. Tech. Hi, I'm Tom Glick, board member. And what's your background? Well, well, what's my background? Uh, city employee for 33 years, planner, just like, just like Nifia. Um, and I've been on the board now for three years and enjoyed every three, every moment of the three years with the board. It's been a rewarding experience. Uh, John, and I'd like to thank both candidates for coming tonight. This is, you know, 200 people. That's going to be a, a really good debate. Actually, it's 200 um, uh, locations. In the hey, hey, the hey, Richard, you, you, you skipped Maria. Did I? Um, no. He Again, comes before K, man. Okay, next is John, John Eisen. Hi, I'm John Eisen, 
And this is the most number of people we've had for a Zoom meeting. So this is very well attended. Thank you okay. for joining us. Maria. Hi, uh, Maria Pavlo Calban. I'm the chair for the legislative committee. Okay. And John Eisen, is he on? He just did. I already talked. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Marshall Long, then uh, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Nancy Sagoyan here. I'm a board member and the membership chair. And if you have joined us, we welcome you. If you're not a member, please consider joining SOHA. We are member supported and we're providing you this debate and we do a lot of great work for our community. So consider joining us and you can email if you'd like information or an application to join SOHA at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Jay, you have to unmute yourself. One, two. Hi, I'm Jay Weitzler. I'm on the housing committee with Maria and also attend the Hillside Federation meetings. Uh, and I'd like to mention that uh, one of the council people uh, introduced uh, and, and got passed legislation to restrict building in the hillside fire zones until the end of November, which uh, the Federation wanted to thank him for because uh, the narrow streets are in a high fire zone. And since there's no more building until the end, no more construction until the end of November, uh, that'll lend some extra safety. And you'll probably hear from that a little bit later. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next we have um, a member of the Los Angeles Unified School District with us this evening, also a candidate uh, for that seat. And this is for the November 3rd election. So each of them will get three minutes uh, to explain you know, why they should be elected or reelected. Um, I have, we'll go with uh, Marilyn. Pick a hand, right or left. Right, please. Okay, you are going to go second. Okay, uh, so Scott, you can introduce yourself. And thank uh, you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Scott Schmerlson, and I want to thank you, first of all, Sherman Oaks uh, Homeowners Association, for inviting me to speak tonight. I, I really appreciate being here. I currently serve on the LAUSD Board of Education and Board District 3, which serves the Northwest and Central Valley and also this part of Sherman Oaks. So the schools that I have in my area in Sherman Oaks are Dixie Canyon Elementary, Chandler Elementary, and they have new, a new principal this year, Mr. Skoll, Kester Elementary, Riverside Elementary with a fairly new principal, Ms. Nicole Richardson, Sherman Oaks Elementary, Van Nuys Middle, and Millican Middle School, whose leadership right now is reaching out to uh, the community about a name change for the school. So I am currently running for re-election. And as most of you know, I believe I've been a lifelong educator for four decades, that's 40 years. And my career has begun as a Spanish teacher. And I served as a middle school counselor, an assistant principal, and a principal for many years. I would really need more than three minutes to discuss my accomplishments on the board in the areas of parent engagement, um, gosh, support for students with special needs, safety and environmental health. And I suspect, however, that everybody is more interested in hearing that LA Unified is continuing to address the COVID-19 crisis by implementing our own testing program and a thoughtful hybrid instructional plan to prepare for our students' safe return to class. And I will not deny that distance learning has been more difficult than anyone could ever imagine. But we currently have about a 98% student attendance rate, at district-wide of course, and an 88% online district-wide rate. So nevertheless, my absolute priority right now is to make sure that we reopen our classes when the doctors and the scientists say it is safe and that we continue to find ways to support our most vulnerable children during these challenging times. And I am confident that our students will emerge from this crisis stronger and better prepared 
to be leaders in this complex 21st century economy. So in closing, I believe that I have been an effective educator, an effective school administrator, and an effective board member. During this terrible health crisis, we need experience, governance more than ever. So I just want you to know that I have been endorsed by the Los Angeles Times, a state superintendent of uh, education, Tony Thurman, our teachers and classified employees, the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Project, and the Sierra Club, just to name a few. So I proudly stand on my record of public service, and I hope you'll support my reelection to the LAUSD Board of Education. And thank you very much for letting me speak. Perfect three minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Marilyn, whoops. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me today. And um, thank you for providing this opportunity for your residents to um, engage in these matters for civic as well as our school issues. I'm Marilyn Kozatek. I'm running for LAUSD School Board. And, and look, I'm a mom. I have two little boys in school right now in LAUSD. And if elected, I would be the only board member in the current state that actually has a child in the school district. And I think it's so important, especially moments of crisis that we're in right now, that we have our elected officials have skin in the game and that we're in this because we just want to see what's what's best for our kids. So for me, this is about uh, this is about really making sure that we have opportunities um, for for all our kids, for my kids and all 600,000 students here in our beautiful city of Los Angeles. So the other thing about me is I work at Granada Hills High School, one of the highest performing schools here in our valley, maybe even our state. There I lead the tutoring and enrichment program, the after school program. I've also done uh, community outreach work because to me it's so vital that we have really uh, strong connections with our community and with our parents. I have seen firsthand that by really uplifting the voices of our parents, we're able to elevate outcomes for our students. So um, that's what I do at Granada Hills High School. And um, I also am in charge of digital communication technology. And that's one of the things that brings me to talk about COVID-19. Look, I would be the only board member that has experienced distance learning as a parent. And I can tell you, this is one of the most challenging experiences of my lifetime. And I think that most parents, especially those who are working like me um, and juggling it all, this is a really, really tough moment in history. And I, I feel like I can use that operational skill set um, that is really a true understanding of digital tools and skills and understanding of blended and online learning to really be able to shepherd us through this crisis. So, um, so for me, I, I, this is about bringing an expertise of digital knowledge to the school board, an operational expertise, uh, boots on the ground inside a school in the year 2020. And of course, most importantly, of being a mom and the passion that goes along with really always doing what's best for kids. I'm also endorsed by the Los, by the Los Angeles Daily News for my uh, budgetary expertise. And- By um, what? Expertise. And so I'm just, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. I think she lost her place. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. You're good, thank you. Richard, you're on mute. Sorry. Thank you, Mar I want to thank Ma uh, Marilyn. And we're now going to go on to uh, Senior Lead Officer, Jose yes. Saldana. And give us an update on what's happening and how people can uh, talk with you. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Officer Saldana. I'm the Senior Lead Officer for the Southern portion of Sherman Oaks. Officer Barry has retired and, uh, and it's, uh, the seat is still vacant for uh, Officer Barry. Uh, we had a temporary senior lead officer, Charette, and he is uh, on vacation uh, this month. Uh, we're, oh, are getting, we are getting a temporary senior lead officer next in a couple of weeks uh, until the seat is feel, filled. Uh, as a senior lead officer, I cover the, the southern portion, which is pretty much uh, the 101 freeway between Van Nuys and Woodman, Sepulveda and Coldwater Canyon, um, uh, up to Mulholland Drive. That's my whole area. That's where I cover. Officer Barry covers the Salmon area, basically from Chandler to the 101 freeway. Uh, so um, 
for right now, we're both down considering the, 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 the situation that we've been involved uh, in the COVID, we're down in crime. Uh, we're down on property crime together close to about 11% in property crime. Our, my violent crime and the southern portion of Shumarok, which is the green area out here, I'm down almost uh, uh, 20% on violent crime from last year. So we're doing real good on that. However, our grand theft autos has increased tremendously from last year to this year. This year, uh, we have a total of 90 uh, stolen cars uh, in, in, uh, in my specific area only. Compared to last year, it was only 40. So it's a big, huge jump from last year. And I think it's due to COVID and people being at home uh, and the cars being parked there for a long time. People are just taking advantage of taking cars, so that's that's it could be a uh, a possibility why it's it's happening, but uh, for the most part we are doing real good, uh, in, in our crime level, uh, for the Sherman Oaks area. Thank you. Okay, with that. Uh, next up is uh, Andy Solomon. He's deputy city attorney. And he's gonna give us an update on what's happening and what he does. And his boss is gonna be here next month. So if you have any uh, questions for his boss that relates to Andy or any comments, please communicate them to us. With that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Richard. Hi everyone, I am Andy Solomon. I am a deputy city attorney from the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. I'm your friendly neighborhood prosecutor. I'm not a normal prosecutor. I deal with a lot of the recurring issues, the weird wacky issues, basically anything that uh, wouldn't be solvable through the normal avenues of um, people reaching out for help. So uh, I'll keep it short. You should reach out to me if you have any kind of recurring issue that you cannot solve by using the typical normal means that you have available to you. So if it's a recurring issue or something that's a little bit more complicated, you would typically reach out to your senior lead officer, like Officer Saldana, um, and they would work with me, or you could reach out with me directly. Even if I'm not able to help you directly, I will at least steer you towards the right people that can help you if, if, there's, if it's something the city can help with, or the county, or the state, whoever. I typically work with the community and officers and everybody I can to get problems solved. So the way to reach me, the best way is email, especially during these times where I'm running around. My email address is a n d y my first name dot solomon s o l i m a n at l a city dot org o r g. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is Brad Fingard. He's a field deputy for Councilman David Rue. Good evening, everyone. As Richard said, I'm Councilmember Ruse, Field Deputy for the Sherman Oaks community. Um, I work with wonderful folks like Andy and Officer Saldana, all the other SLOs, and the various departments across the city. So if you are having any issues in Sherman Oaks, uh, whether it be uh, just neighborhood concerns or issues with the departments, you can reach out to me by emailing brad.fingard at lacity.org. Uh, and I wanted to give a few brief updates before the, the main event here. Uh, first and foremost, some of the updates uh, related to the newsletter items. The Chandler Boulevard Median Maintenance Project was actually completed just this past weekend. Um, and since our SOHA meeting, the Sherman Oaks Business Improvement District Street Lighting Median Project was also completed. Both of those projects were made possible from allocations from Councilmember Roos discretionary funds. Um, Councilmember Rue also had uh, legislation seeking to create a permanent LA Alfresco program. That's the city's outdoor dining program. Uh, that legislation was passed out of the Transportation Committee this Monday and we'll be moving forward to the full council for a vote. Um, and just a quick update also uh, on what Officer Saldana touched on. So for folks who live in the two basic, our, basic car areas just north of Officer Saldana, um, you may have worked with Officer Charette or Officer Reiner. Their rotations are ending next week, 
and Officer um, Hernandez and Officer Leon will be taking over for them. So once they get settled in, I would love to introduce you all to them and then you know, work with them to address some of your concerns. Again, to reach me, you can email brad.fingard, F-I-N-G-A-R-D, at lac.org, or call our Sherman Oaks District Office at 818-728-9924. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, let's go on to um, our debate. First of all, uh, Phil Schumann, Channel 11 News, got a last minute assignment and he's out in the field, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, so he could not be with us this evening. So we have Linda Grasso, who's replacing him. Who's Linda Grasso? Linda, hi. Um, she is editor in chief of, of Ventura Boulevard magazine, which most of you receive. Well, what is the distribution area? Linda for Ventura Boulevard magazine. So we are mailed to 25,000 homes. It stretches all the way west to Calabasas to Noho Toluca Lake in the east. And basically it's a magazine model where oh. we're mailed to the homes in the higher income areas. I mean, that's who advertisers want to reach. So the old business model was where you subscribe and you paid $29.95 and now you go and you blanket the areas of the people that advertisers want to reach. Okay. So, so what is your background in news? Because you, you, know, you have a very, very important task tonight to, as moderator. Do you have any news background? <laughs> well, I'm a journalist who has worked in every medium. I started out in television. I was a news reporter and an anchor for 16 years. I worked in many markets um, in Florida. I worked at uh, NBC in New York. I worked at KTTV before Phil Schumann got there. Um, and I also worked at E! Entertainment Television. I did a show called E! News and I hosted a number of programs on that. And then I was the founding editor. I am the founding editor of Ventura Boulevard Magazine. We've been alive for 11 years. Has gone by so quickly. Um, and we are a platform that is in print and also online. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, if we could have our two candidates, uh, David and Nithya, up on the screen. Uh, before I turn it over to Linda. Oh, Tyson, uh, the start is with that. Okay, so um, Nithya. Richard, R Richard I, I'm sorry, before you start, uh, can you tell Sally to mute hers? Bob can't mute Sally. And there's background noise on Sally's uh, and it's gonna be dis uh, disruptive. Okay. Um, before I do that, um, okay, Nithya, uh, can you uh, pick a hand and we'll determine who goes first and who goes second? Which hand? Right. Okay, let's see what it says. Okay, it says that you are number one. Okay, with that, uh, Linda, you have the floor. Awesome. So I am not just throwing this out there. I'm seeing Nithya. Hi, Nithya. I'm not seeing David. Is, should I be seeing he'll him? Be there, he'll be there in a second. Oh. oh, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Anyhow, let's get started, Nithya, since you are going first. Um, before we get into some of the more complex issues, um, I'd like to start with a more simple question, a basic question. What do you see as the role of an LA city council member? How would you describe it? Um, so are we starting with our questions right away? Are you guys going to do an opening statement first? Oh, I wasn't sure. Whatever you'd like, Linda. You know what? Uh, Richard, I think you did want that. So let's let them make their opening statement. Isn't that what you wanted, Richard? Yeah, if we yeah, do a uh, two-minute opening statement let's so people can get a feel for both parties. Awesome. Nithya, go ahead. Great. Okay, well, um, thank you so much to SOHA for having me here tonight. This was actually the last forum that I did during the primary, and it was by far the most fun forum that I did. So I'm very happy to be here and to be sharing this space with so many of you again. You know, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about who I am and, and why I got into this race. Uh, I'm an urban planner by training. I have a master's in urban planning from MIT. I've spent most of my career working on urban poverty issues. I'm an immigrant to America. I moved here with my mother when I was six years old. And my early experiences as an immigrant to this country and the struggles that my family faced really shaped my focus on social justice as an adult and in my career. Um, I'm also a mother of twin preschoolers who've been home during the pandemic. 
And I've had an interesting time running this race while also homeschooling my children. You know, I got into this race for, uh, I think, a really important reason. I wanted to talk about policy. I wanted to talk about ideas for what I saw as some of the biggest challenges facing us as a city, from homelessness to climate change, to addressing neighborhood issues, to addressing our city's widespread corruption. There are so many shared crises that we are facing as a city right now. And I really wanted to run a campaign that put issues forward, that put policy solutions forward, and that really focused on solving what I thought was one of the biggest issues with our local LA city politics, which is that too few people knew who their city council member was, knew about the powers of the council to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. And we've run, very proud to say, the kind of campaign which has really focused on bringing so many people into this race. Number of volunteers we've had have been the thing that have kept me going over these last few months. So I wanna just say again, that I'm so grateful for this opportunity to speak with you and I'm looking forward to answering all of your questions tonight. Thank you. Uh, David, two minutes, please. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Linda. And I wanna have to say a good evening to Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association. My name is David Rue, and I am proud to be your council member. Over the past five years, I have built a track record of working with the community, focusing on critical issues like homelessness and infrastructure, and stopping irresponsible overdevelopment. District four deserves a leadership that is clear, consistent, and focused on your needs. The choice before you is clear. I led the fight against SB 50 and other developer giveaways while my opponent flip-flops on this issue. And even now she supports Sacramento's land grab like SB 1120. I believe in ending homelessness and I am the only candidate in this race who has a FEMA-like emergency response to end homelessness with two decades of experience in creating homeless services and housing. My opponent has never built homeless housing and her three-year-old organization's mission is not to end homelessness. I believe we need thoughtful and meaningful reform to public safety in Los Angeles, like my Office of Violence Prevention. Unfortunately, my opponent signed a pledge to cut the police by 98%. More importantly, because I'm sure she's gonna walk back this pledge tonight, her top endorsers, the Democratic Socialists of America, goes even further. Their goal is to totally abolish the police. These issues are too important to ignore. These are the issues that affect real people's lives and voters deserve to know the truth about our record, the promises we've made and the people behind our campaigns. I have a record of working with communities on the most critical issues of our time. I have kept my promises to focus on neighborhoods and refuse developer contributions. And I am supported by over 300 community leaders because I listen and I do the work. I am honored to work with the Sherman Oaks and, and I'm looking forward to discussing tonight. Thank you. Uh, okay, Linda, back to you. Nithi, I'm gonna go back to that original question that I said in the beginning. Um, and I'm going to touch off what you said. You said in your opening statement that too few people actually know who their city council person is. They don't even, and then they don't know what they do. So, how do you envision the role of an LA city council member? Well, I, you know, I, I want to talk about that, but first, I just want to take a moment to respond to Council Member Rue's opening statement. I've been really disappointed with the number of lies and the negativity that's been directed towards my campaign in the last few weeks. Um, it's been really disheartening as someone who's new to politics, who's never uh, thought of herself as a politician who stepped into this space because I really felt like I needed to show okay. leadership to address Nithya, LA's Nithya, biggest challenges. Nithya, Nithya yeah. we'll spend 45 seconds to answer the question. So you know, and Nithya, we'll, we'll get into that a little deeper. I know that. Yeah, well, I, you know, I just, I really think it's important to say that part of the role of a council member is to be truthful to address issues, to talk about policies, and to have that public discussion. And, and I'll have a chance to respond to that, and we'll, we'll get into it deep. But first, let's just do a quick basic. What do you see as the role of an LA City Council person? I really think the role of a City Council person is to be proactive, which is exactly what we've done, even in the time that I've been involved in this campaign. It uh, We've run a campaign that has been 
really focused on bringing people into our municipal politics, to telling them about what the city council can do for them, to making sure that their needs are met when we did things like reach out to residents for, um, for as part of the campaign, we always asked them how we could help. That to me is the missing piece that I've seen in our city council so far, that we really need to have people who are proactively reaching out to residents and making sure that their needs are met using the full powers of the council available to us. Thank you very much. Say that one to you. How do you envision the role of an LA city councilman? Me? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. Um, you know, city council member is, we are on the front lines. I am your first line of defense. When no matter what happens, this is what you call your local council member. Whether it's an issue that the city could handle or not, if it is not something that we do, I will connect you to the state, the county, the federal government, whoever it is, to get your services and, and your questions answered. You know, it's about all the basic services of tree trimming, potholes, median repairs, uh, sidewalk repairs. And, and you know I am passionate about these issues of development uh, and local issues as I am as I am working on issues of homelessness and anti-corruption. And you know I will fight for you as I have in the past five years to, to work on your issue that might not affect the rest of your neighborhood, the rest of the city, but I am your council member. I have not forgotten what, what it is that I am and what I ran for. I ran for, the, for council district four to serve you and to uh, service your neighborhood. Um, as well as the city of Los Angeles. You. Um, and, you know, and, and also as a council member, it's about bringing everybody together. Yes, Thank there's the divisiveness happening nationally Thank and you. locally. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is another question for both of you. Um, before, this data, before this debate, I was reading through both of your responses to a questionnaire that the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association sent to both of you. And it was really interesting. There were a lot of things that you guys agreed on. Um, that said, what do you see as the three most critical differences between you and your opponent? Nithya, we'll start with you. Well, you know, I think that um, I bring a clarity of perspective on what needs to be done to really address homelessness, not just to uh, allow the situation to get worse, but to really end homelessness, to get people into housing, to make sure that we're kind of providing the kinds of services that can really get people permanently off of the streets and into the care and housing that they so desperately need. I think I bring a real level of integrity that I don't see in our city council nowadays. Even today, there was more reports of um, real issues coming out from city hall around sexual harassment. We need council members who are willing to speak up and to fight for what's right. Uh, I also bring, as I said, an incredible work ethic that we've demonstrated throughout this campaign. I want to work hard for you when problems are still solvable, not after they become crises that are too big for us to solve. Thank you. David? What was the, can you, that was the question, three questions, three. What are the okay. three most critical differences you see between yourself and Nithya? Yeah, I think there's a lot more than three, but the I spoke about the first one. Um, I think especially what's going on with all the civil unrest and the need for systemic reforms in racial equity, policing, uh, corruption, homelessness. You know, the big difference, as I mentioned earlier, is that my opponent actually signed a pledge. Um, she signed the pledge to cut the police department by 98%. The second difference is homelessness. Um, it's very easy to talk to talk, but it's actually action speaks louder than words. Um, it, you need someone who could actually turn that rhetoric into action. Um, it, it's, uh, and, and I have the track record of close to 20 years on working on homelessness, working on building homeless housing, uh, mental health services, um, everything related and around homelessness. And the third thank, thing- Thank you very, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 90 yeah. seconds quick. <laughs> So, David, you brought up uh, the whole issue with Nithya supporting the people's budget or signing the petition. So let's just throw it out there and talk about it now, because I think we're going to keep coming back. Let's let's suss it out. Um, Nithya, you signed a petition supporting the people's budget, which, call, which calls on the council to reallocate law enforcement funding. The people's budget proposes to allocate 1.64 percent of the city's general fund towards law enforcement. I think that's currently uh, 40 percent of the city's general fund is allocated. So that's a huge difference. 
People's Budget LA says its ultimate goal is the abolition of police and prisons. Now you have also said that you do not support abolishing police, but with a 98% funding reduction, one could certainly argue that that's an eradication. Address that as clearly and concisely as you can. Absolutely. The people's budget actually was a survey of priorities. It did not propose a specific budgetary allocation or a cut. And Black Lives Matter actually clarified this and asked Council Member Taru to stop misrepresenting their work as a 98% budget cut. And I request that he stop as well. To me, what is required in our police budget right now is to look at what percentage of our police budget is being spent on addressing things like violent crime and how much of our police time is being spent addressing issues for which armed police response is simply either not relevant or perhaps even inappropriate and can exacerbate the situation. I wanna look at that and make sure that we're funding unarmed responders to those Thank issues uh, in, in the way that we can. Thank you. David, do you wanna to respond to that? Um, sure. You know, and this is what I said earlier. Um, I, I knew she was going to backtrack on it, but the reality is there is an actual pledge uh, that's available online where she signed a 98%. But this is the question. If she's backtracking on this now, um, as you stated, Linda, her supporters, her main supporters from the Democratic Socialists of America, Ground Game LA, No One Olympics, have vociferously, have adamantly, time and time again, stated their position is to abolish the police. So my question is, I don't know what uh, my opponent stands for and who is she going to re represent? Does she support abolishing it or not abolishing it? And if she doesn't, then shouldn't she disavow the fact that she will not abolish the police department? Thank you. I'm going to let you respond to that. Go ahead. Um, uh, well, you know, I would just say that I have made my positions clearer than any city council candidate in LA city history. I have the most detailed policies on my website and groups that endorse me, I don't always agree with everything that is on their platforms. That's not how the endorsement process works. How the endorsement process works is that they choose a candidate whose policies and values they stand behind. Many, many candidates across the city have been endorsed by the DSA, including Lorraine Lundquist, who ran in the district nearby. Many candidates have been endorsed by so many of the groups that I'm working with. But what I stand for is clearly laid out on my website. I've never flip-flopped on anything. And in fact, I've done the most work of any candidate across the city to make it exactly clear what my vision of change for Los Angeles looks like. Thank you. Um, David, critics call you a career politician. And then they say, out with the old, in with the new. How do you respond to that? Uh, if you can recall my election five years ago, and Sherman Oaks knows this very well because I won because of Sherman Oaks. Um, I was the David that slayed the mighty Goliath of City Hall. Five years ago when there were 14 candidates running, I was the underdog, the outsider, the reformer, where no one said I had a shot of winning. But you know what? This is a democracy. This is the United States of America, and this is the city of Los Angeles. You do not tell Angelinos or Sherman Oaks residents who, who their elected official is going to be. And I fought the system and I beat the system with your help. And I've been in the office for five years now. I have provided past landmark legislation that people said was not possible, but because of your help working together, whether it's anti-corruption, building homeless housing, uh, passing in uh, baseline mansionization and hillside Thank ordinances. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. We did it together. Nithi, I'm going to put you in that category of being a critic of David's and his performance over the past four years. What specifically do you take issue with that he just pointed out? Well, you know, let's look at, for example, the anti-corruption legislation that David has put forward here in LA. Uh, critics of this policy call it worse than doing nothing at all. So full of loopholes was the developer ban that was passed uh, in LA. Uh, and for someone who came into City Hall calling himself an outsider and a reformer, if you look at his record of voting in City Council, he voted unanimously with the other council members over 90% of the time. That to me is not a sign of a maverick or a reformer. That's a sign of someone who is very much ensconced within our current system, who's endorsed by every sitting City Council member and the mayor, and who is being supported by them in huge amounts. I bring a true independent perspective to City Hall. You need to speak out 
And that's Thank what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. David, I'm going to go ahead and let you respond to that. Go ahead. Thank you. Unfortunately, I have not been endorsed by all the city council members, but as a matter of fact, the individuals that uh, my opponent is talking about who says that there's too many loopholes and the, and the developer ban doesn't go far enough, you know what? They're absolutely correct. That was the base platform law that I'm building on. But those same critics are the same folks that four, four or five years ago when I first introduced the law, they said it is impossible to pass. You will never get it passed. They are the same people who are now saying it doesn't go far enough. Absolutely, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, when I pass the law, I try to make it stronger, but they're the ones who would not second it or support it. And as a matter of fact, when I was working on this, I, I didn't see any of my opponent or my opponent supporters um, there to help me pass this landmark legislation. Thank you. Nithya, this one's for you. Critics of yours compare you to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, saying you have lots of ideas, but have not articulated a clear path for execution i.e. how you're going to finance those ideas. How do you respond to that? Well, you know, I think a lot of the ideas that I've proposed actually talk about taking our existing and really fiscally irresponsible spending at City Hall and spending it in ways that actually meet the needs of this moment. I look at a project like HHH, for example, which all of our council members came out and advocated for. Uh, I phone banked for it. I was a huge supporter of it. And yet in its implementation, because of lack of oversight from our city hall officials, our tax dollars were wasted. We're getting way fewer homeless housing units than we were promised. They're taking far longer than we were promised and they're not meeting the needs of this moment. You need someone with focus, urgency to make sure that our dollars currently being spent are being spent responsibly. That's what I'm proposing. Thank you. David, go ahead. You know, I think this shows a lack of understanding of what measure HHH was. Um, it's a $1.2 billion bond um, to build homeless housing. And as a matter of fact, the cost is not, people like to focus on just the highest cost, but it's an average cost. I've built homeless housing that is $62,000 to $68,000 per bed. Um, what we're talking about is the HHH, which is, um, uh, used with uh, labor, uh, using union labor that are paying good paying jobs. I don't know if my opponent is saying that we should not be paying um, good paying salaries to build these facilities. We're also competing with at market developers to build this homeless housing. Um, you know, it, it, it's not that we could uh, buy it at a cheaper rate, um, you know, because these are private properties. Uh, we're Thank expanding you. on every single- Thank you very much. Property. Thank you. Hmm. This is a question for both of you. You know, so many of us move to the Valley, not just to get a little extra land to raise our families, um, but also we wanted to be near the, the boulevard with all the shops and the restaurants and it was such a vibrant area. And as you both know, I mean, it's awful driving down the boulevard now. Give us some strategies, give us some plans. How are we gonna restore and bring back the boulevard to what it was? Nithya, go ahead, you go first. Are you referring to um, business closure as a result of COVID or, uh, or other yeah. issues? Vacancy after vacancy, yes. Okay, all right. I just wasn't sure because no, last no referring to something else. No um, well, we just we you know we just put out a really um, kind of comprehensive small business platform from our uh, from our campaign, and I want to talk about a couple of the pieces from that platform. One is that I think we should be doing a lot more to make sure that businesses that are dealing with extremely high rents and rents for small businesses were huge compared to revenues even before COVID. After COVID, now those rents are just absolutely out of control. I want to propose a really strong mediation program, similar to ones in other cities that have been very successful, that will help landlords to come to the table and also put on incentives like a vacancy tax for commercial establishments that are vacant that will push landlords to really come to the table and do that renegotiation. The city needs to do everything it can within its powers to make sure that we're addressing this question of rents. Thank you. David, share with us some of your strategies. You know, my parents being small business owners, we know what it means to struggle to keep the lights on and to keep the business going, especially during this COVID. This is why it's so personal to me. And this is where no matter what the ideas are, we are limited because the federal government COVID aid is around $700 million. But irrespective of that, this is why I made our FESCO program permanent. Uh, and we are moving forward. Uh, the Alfresco program came from communities and council district four like Larchmont Village and other places and we replicated citywide um, and we're trying to make it permanent. I have introduced a $100 million local paycheck 
a PPP program for our local businesses who weren't able to qualify. Uh, I've been working with local businesses like Cobra to make sure that we are tailor making uh, what businesses need in Sherman Oaks and elsewhere uh, to help them get back in. Our businesses Thank have you. been hardest hit. Thank you. And Linda, do we want to go on to the next section? Sure. The um, this is a section where uh, each candidate has the opportunity to ask the other candidate a question. <laughs> Is that the one you're referring to, Richard? Right, and uh, the question will be limited to 45 seconds, yeah. and the answer is 90 seconds limit. And each candidate yeah. is going to be able to ask the other candidate two questions, right? Correct. Okay, so we started with Nithya. Should we start with her in this one or shift to David? Switch to David. Let's give David a chance. David, what would you like to ask your opponent? Um, my first question is, uh, in regards to defunding the police, um, in your website, it says you plan to enact a, and I quote, a much smaller specialized armed force to serve our city. How much smaller is actually smaller? Yeah, I actually don't know because I don't have a lot of clarity about how the police is currently allocating its time and its budgetary allocations. Right now, here's what we know as residents. We know that uh, about 8% of calls for service for the LAPD are for violent crime. We know that the LAPD is sent out for a whole host of things that could be better served by things that are not responded to by armed first responders. So this includes things like non-urgent calls about homelessness, which takes up a huge amount of police officers' time in my own neighborhood. It uh, relates to things like mental health crisis calls, which really are better off addressed, especially if there's no risk of violence by a mental health caseworker. Um, things like traffic collisions and taking traffic reports. We don't know, however, right now, we don't have that kind of transparency available to know how much of our budget is going to one or the other. And I think we need that kind of clarity before we can figure out how to reallocate that budget. Public safety is one of the most important things that a city provides for its residents. And I would never, make assertions about what percentage goes to what without having the data in front of me. I think that if we were to do this, we would actually free up resources for the police to be able to respond to violent crime in ways that are more effective than what they're doing right now, more efficiently. And I also think that this response reduces the risk of real violence to black and brown communities. The question that has been in front of us for the past few months since these protests, something that we must grapple with as a city, something that we are grappling with as a nation. Thank you. Yeah, what question would you like to ask your opponent? Oh, sure. Um, well, you know, uh, David, you've called for banning direct donations from corporations, from LLCs and PACs. You called it, quote, a no-brainer for the sake of transparency and disclosure. Um, we agree. So we don't take those donations at all. We don't take corporate donations. We don't take money from PACs. But you do. If you think that they should be banned for the sake of our political climate, if you think that they should be banned because it negatively impacts policymaking in Los Angeles, why do you still take that money as a candidate? You know, I am the only council member now and in the entire history of the city council to have made this pledge to not take um, contributions from developers. And I've kept this pledge to refuse developer donations since 2015. At any time, um, sometimes a donation falls to the cracks because a developer doesn't appropriately disclose his or her business and, the, and we immediately return it. But before you start policing other people's donation, I think you should look to your own because you've taken money from numerous sources that you claim that you, that you don't, like CBRE, big oil investors, and management companies. I think we should have Nithya respond to that. Yeah, actually that's uh, totally untrue and the ethics filings show that. I'm not sure what more I need to say, except that Council Member Rue has a record, a public record of ethics donations with over 200 corporations and PACs who've donated to his campaign, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Whenever we saw a donation coming in from anyone involved in the real estate industry, a $300 donation from someone who worked in fossil fuels, my friend in Miami who went to urban planning school with me who made a donation, we gave that money back. Uh, and I don't see Council Member Rue doing that with even companies like Southwest who impact decision-making around issues that he manages in Sherman Oaks, like the flight path issue. You know, it's just uh, easily verifiable falsehoods. 
Thank you. Could I respond? I'm going to switch subjects here. I'm going to let you have your second uh, question to Nithya. What else would you like to ask her? Could I, can I respond to the previous question or no? Yes, I'm going to let you respond to the second oh. this question. Go ahead. Just, just keep it within the, the 40 second boundary. I, I just want to make it clear. The question asked to me was, um, why do I take these donations? And uh, clearly, uh, when they slip the cracks, I return them. And I think my opponent is referring to corporate donations. And again, my opponent says exactly the same thing because she also returned them, which means she also taken, has taken developer, corporate and real estate donations as well. So I think that the fact is we both have mistakenly taken these donations. And as soon as we find out, we both return them. So I don't understand why there is a hypocrisy. But here. you didn't do return 200 corporate donations. That's what the question was about. So I'm not talking about the, any that you did return. I'm talking about the ones, many that you did return. You have kept hundreds of thousands of dollars. of. As Ms. Rahman says, um, she has plenty of corporate donations as well, as well no, as- No, I have zero. Please look at the ethics website. I'm sorry, guys. This is, you can't let lies stand like this. This is not fair. And, and- and, and, and everyone could check on the ethics website. It is absolutely completely visible. Uh, you could see the many uh, individuals that work in corporations and, and real estate as well that has all donated to her campaign. So, um, and, you know, and it is fully transparent. So this is- Well, anyone who wants to investigate certainly has some leads yes. there. So I encourage you to take a look at this all tonight. David, what's your second question for your opponent? Yes, my second question is um, throughout this campaign, your supporters and endorsers have harassed journalists, they have bullied volunteers, and they have even published my home address and put my family at risk. The group behind this are the Democratic Socialists of America Los Angeles, of which you are a member of, have you, and, and have spoken in, in support of their violent confrontation at peaceful protests. You have said before that you disavow violence and harassing actions, but today will you disavow the Democratic Socialists of America, which pushes this behavior? Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, I just wanted to say up front and make it very clear to everyone who is watching this debate that I have never supported nor encouraged any kind of personal attacks on any sitting elected, uh, on any kind of uh, public official here in Los Angeles. It's just simply nothing we've ever, ever done. And I, I will say it very clearly right now, I condemn all personal attacks. I don't feel like they are relevant for our debate right now. What I will say though, is that I do agree with Council Member Rue that there is a lot of anger out there right now. And it's not just Council Member Rue that's receiving it, it is Council Member Bonin, it's Council Member uh, Mitch O'Farrell, it is people who are not running in elections right now. There is a huge amount even I've received this kind of harassment, calls to my office uh, with swear words and all kinds of other kinds of harassment. People are angry right now and there's a lot of frustration about the very real problems that Los Angeles is facing. I think that my approach has been to really lead with positivity, to I channeled my frustrations into this campaign, into a positive vision for how we can address LA's biggest challenges. And I've inspired hundreds of people, actually over uh, close to 2000 people to get involved with our race, to put their energy into positive change in Los Angeles. And that's really the way in which I have led uh, on this issue and on every other issue here. Um, and you know, that's, that's that. Thank you. Go ahead, Can I respond? Can I respond? Yeah. Um, let me make it clear. I disavow any individual or any organization that promotes violence, uh, promotes hate to me, to my opponent, to anybody. And I disavow individuals and organizations because as an elected official, we have to set that example and we have to be careful how we inspire. So my opponent has not answered the question. I am not asking if you disavow violence um, and hate. I am asking if you would disavow organizations that are spewing violence and hate. Will you disavow oh, DSA? Uh, Council member Bonin called this red baiting and fear mongering uh, in an article today about what was being said. This is exactly what is happening. Um, the DSA is not promoting violence against David Rue. Individuals on the internet may be saying negative things, but it is the wild west out there. I cannot claim to take responsibility for this. What I can do is to lead with integrity to lead with the kind of values that I have always shown throughout this campaign. And I'll just 
want to make it clear, there's only one campaign that is attacking another campaign. There's only one candidate that's going on the attack against another candidate. That's how I show leadership here. Um, you know? before, I give, before I give you an opportunity to ask your question, your last question to David, I just want to be crystal clear on this because I'm not in your district. I'm not going to vote for either of you. But I was reading up on this and I was a little confused because, you know, it seems like I was reading and just tell me if this is true or not true, that, that the Democratic Socialists of America, that they are fundraising and phone banking for you. Is that true or is that not true? Uh, yes, as many of the endorsement organizations who are working for my campaign are, there's a whole okay. range of them that have okay. done that, et cetera. And then in, in some other literature that I read, it said that it's told its followers that police are pigs, that all cops are bastards, and that cops go hand in hand with the Klan. In your opinion, is that true or not true? That they have... have... You know, I, <laughs> I don't agree with everything that is on the DSA's platform. However, that's, I will say that they, I have very, made it very clear that this is not but like- that's, that's really tricky though. You're saying I don't support them, but you're getting support from them. It's great. In a sense, you could be seen as aligning yourself with them because they are working for you. I guess I would say that, you know, there are many, many people who have supported Council Member Rue, including many Republicans, for example. <laughs> for this though. And I'm on you for this. I'm trying to, I mean, I'm looking at you. No, I guess I'm just saying I don't hold him responsible twins. for the I'm sensing a disconnect here as a human. And I need to understand. I mean, I, uh, this is not language that I support. This is not language I use. This is not language that we have ever used. This is truly like what we can do in this city is what our campaign has put forward. We have led with positivity. We have led with love. That is always what I have done in my work. And I just don't feel like I need to be, uh, you know, uh, so many organizations say things and have platform issues that candidates don't always agree with. Endorsing organizations have large platforms and large issues. And they don't agree with everything that the candidate says and vice versa. Yeah, Council Member Rue also has so many of these. And I'm not asking him, for example, uh, to kind of take on uh, the values of every single person and every single organization that has uh, endorsed him. This is just not unfair. I, this, is, this is exactly the kind of, um, I feel like, the, the same rhetoric that's always used to criticize progressive candidates across the country this is the same rhetoric that's used to criticize younger candidates and candidates that have younger supporters. I, to me, it's, it feels very, very unfair um, to hold me to a different standard from the one that you're holding council member uh, Rude to. Go ahead, David. You know, you could be progressive as I am without hate. Um, hate only begets hate, violence only begets violence. Um, and just to make it clear, I disavow the police protective league. Uh, the re union that represents LAPD, because I disagreed um, uh, with with their uh, with their platform, so I disavowed them. So if you disagree with what a group is doing, then I am asking if you would disavow their hateful rhetoric and their uh, uh, violent uh, preachings. Um, okay. And I just, just one, one 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 thing to clear is about. there's a difference between the language that people are using. They have not committed any acts of violence. It's, far as I know, what the DSA has done is break light clinics. They had a fundraiser to raise funds for undocumented immigrants where people gave their money from stimulus checks to them. It's a big difference between some off color tweets and like talking about real violence. And I just want to make it clear that that's what we're doing right now is conflating those two. Real violence is a real problem. Uh, you know, he, Council Member Rue worked with the DSA on a park opening in his district. Uh, they've endorsed numerous candidates around the city. The only reason we're talking about it now is because David Rue's made this a campaign issue because he wants to go negative on our campaign instead of really focusing on what I think are this very, very important issues that we are grappling with as a city. And the very clear and substantive policy platforms that I've offered in response to them. You know, that's, 
let's move on. Let's okay, move on. Yeah, let's I, I, your, can I finish, Linda? I, I didn't get to finish. No, I, I, think, I think we've kind of gone over that well, one. I just wanted to finish my thought because, you know, um, the third point I wanted I'm to- I'm sorry, we've just given a lot of space to something which has been entirely pushed by the Rue campaign. I would really love to make sure that we are being fair in this debate and that we're really addressing the issues that really impact Sherman Oaks residents. So, and actually this impacts Sherman Oaks residents. I think it's very important. Voters know what we stand for, who, who supports us, and what are the motivating factors behind our policymaking decisions. So I think this is very important to Sherman Oaks. I think the future of uh, policing in the 21st century is very important. I believe in transforming the police department, not abolishing the police department. And I think it's da very dangerous uh, to say want to abolish or be supported by groups that they're Here, here's, here's one thing I will say though, uh, the only time you disavowed the Police Protective League was after the George Floyd protest, after it became politically important to do that. They had their rhetoric from the beginning. Let's and they move did, on. you know, so, you know, it's just like, you did it now. We're Let's move on. Let's move on. I think we've covered that one. I wanted to address the one point that my opponent brought out about the attack ads. My ads are based on fact, and it is pointing out the differences between myself and my opponent. What let's I see- move Let's move on. Nithya, you have, another, you have another shot at asking David any question you want. Go ahead. What is your second and final question for your opponent? I think you get to ask me, Nithya. Yeah, Nithya, oh. go ahead. You get another question for David, so go ahead. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, you know, I think it's very clear that our response to homelessness requires real change in LA. Like what we've been doing, what has happened under your leadership and the leadership of other people in the city of Los Angeles has been horrifying for me to watch. It, it's, it's really, it's a situation that is a humanitarian crisis that is unlike any other. What is it that you're planning to change uh, in your time? Is it, what is a substantive difference in what you're providing us that's really gonna offer people a solution to homelessness, a real, uh, a real transformation in our approach that's really going to reduce what what w this incredible crisis on our streets. You know, it begins with the eight projects that I've already completed in the last two years and three over three hundred beds of housing. Uh, with another six projects, another three hundred beds coming online, hopefully by the end of next year. And our council district will have the highest ratio of beds to our unhoused neighbors than any other district in the city. But that's only the first step because we all know housing solves, nothing solves homelessness like a home, but it's also, we always talk about homelessness being a humanitarian crisis and that deserves an emergency response that we never got till COVID. Once COVID is over, we should still tackle homelessness as I've been asking for for the past year with the fervor and emergent, urgent need that it is required so that we can tackle and house our unhoused neighbors three, four, 6,000 every three months so that we can turn that corner. And this is where, again, it's easy to say, I could solve homelessness. Any one person cannot solve homelessness. If it was that easy to solve, believe me, it would have been solved by now. But this is where it is very complex. And while it is very um, idealistic, um, and, 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 I, and, and I love where my opponent is coming from, but I need her help and your help, all of us to come together. And even then, it's going to take a long time to fix. But this is where we are turning that corner. We know what strategies work. It's housing. It's emergency FEMA-like response where I have been advocating. I am the only one that has been advocating this. I have 20 years experience working in an acute psychiatric hospital, working in the county of Los Angeles, working uh, to build abandoned, refur to refurbish abandoned homes. So I have that history. I have that know-how. It's a matter of execution and we are so close. I know it looks bad right now, but we know how Thank the you. light is at the end of the tunnel. Thank, and we Thank you very much. Thank you. Nithya, did you want to have a, a response to that response? Um, I mean, sure. I guess that I, I was really looking for clarity on what would look different. Because for me, over these last five years in particular, and Council Member Rue has had five years to address not just homelessness, but so many of the issues facing Los Angeles that are we are struggling with in, in such an intense degree. And I failed to hear in his answer uh, a, a real response, a real response to how things would change. Um, and you know, homelessness has risen 72% in this district since he came into power, 78% in the city of Los Angeles. What I would love to see in our elected representatives is 
not a, uh, a response that allocates more responsibility to the mayor, but a response that to me tells me, this is what I'm gonna do differently in my neighborhood. This is what I'm gonna do to make sure people who are experiencing homelessness, people who are seeing a lot of tents and dealing with some of the negative impacts of those on their daily lives, that they have real solutions. Uh, and, and I would just love to see more clarity. I'm gonna I'm gonna segue into questions. We had a we had a lot of a lot of questions from um, homeowners, and and I'm never gonna get to all of them, um, but I want to just segue into into one of them because it, it talks about the homeless. David, isn't one of the issues how are we gonna pay for all of this? I mean, I'm Jules. I'm looking at you in the screen, and I think Jules submitted a question that said something to the effect that it can cost seven hundred thousand dollars to house a homeless person. I mean, how are we gonna come up? We need to come up with, you know, lower cost solutions. And what are some of those? And how are you strategizing that we do that? Because I mean, we're already in a budget mess. How are we gonna pay for housing all these people on the streets? So Linda, we're working on creative solutions already as we speak. And that's why when, yeah. I, talk, when yeah. I talk about the eight projects that we already built, it's a spectrum of services from permanent supportive housing, which, which is about $550,000 per bed, all the way to my bridge housing and, and different types of uh, transitional shelter programs, which cost as low as $60,000 per bed. Mm -hmm. So we're having all of that. And again, this is where I think my opponent's lack of understanding is. Um, she knows that um, the, uh, the two reasons we need to build housing is because um, not only do homeless providers know that's where the solution is, but we're also required by law. Having lofty ideas that does not allow, not only is there no funding, but lack of ability for us to execute um, is, is what's difficult. As a matter of fact, one of the organizations Thank that- you. <clears throat> Thank you, there's a 45 second uh, limit. Thank you very much. Um, David, I'm going to jump back into you with uh, a question that someone on the association wrote in. Um, in the middle of our budget crisis, and again, these are questions that everybody submitted. In the middle of our budget crisis, you have voted to pull off furloughs for thousands of city workers. Are you concerned that this decision will leave the city with an insurmountable budget crisis in 2021? And if so, what is your plan to handle that? Linda? No matter what we do, I mean, this is the absolute truth. And this is why I said earlier on, no matter who uh, gets into office in the presidency or the city council, we are facing a bleak, bleak uh, um, uh, cliff. Um, and the next two to four years is gonna be very difficult. No matter what we do, unless we get the federal government to step up and bail us out, we are going to fall off this fiscal cliff. What I'm trying to do is make sure that um, uh, when the new administration comes in and we get the COVID relief package that we need, that we delay any kind of services that is no, so needed by our communities, by our most vulnerable communities. When everybody is cutting back, when everybody is saving and reducing uh, services, that's when the government needs to step up. And that's why I wanted to prevent furloughs. I wanted to prevent any layoffs as, as much as we can. We go into our reserves, uh, our rainy day funds, to make sure that we are providing as much services, even more services, so the federal government gets its act Thank together you. and comes up with a new deal program. Thank you very much. Nithya, this one's for you. You know, one of the big issues for people who belong to the Homeowners Association is, you know, low income housing and more dense housing and traffic. Those are all right up there. So this one speaks to that. And again, this is a question from someone on the association regarding Senate Bill 1120 that would have allowed the splitting of lots and the addition of numerous housing units per split lots as a means of addressing California's housing crisis. On SOHA's candidate questionnaire, you said you supported lot splitting. Some believe a far better solution is to add density in appropriate areas by converting the hundreds, perhaps thousands of vacant storefronts and commercial buildings to multi-use retail and housing. This solution could solve several housing issues by adding needed housing along transit corridors, preventing the blight that occurs around vacant buildings while protecting the quality of life, family life that exists in single family neighborhoods. What is your justification of turning single family neighborhoods into dense areas with more traffic, not a lot of parking or green space rather than choosing a solution that saves neighborhoods, prevents blight and adds the housing needed on transit corridors? Linda, this question was for Nithia, not for David. No, I, I posted it to Nithia. We're on the wrong, this is for Nithia. David got the last one. Great, well, you know, I, 
I I said David if I did I apologize I have it down here for Nithya okay should I answer yeah please do yeah well, so, you know, for 1120, I appreciated that it kept development at a neighborhood scale. I, I especially appreciated that it uh, encouraged uh, smaller units as opposed to mansions, which is what I see coming up a lot. But let me be very clear, my focus in my work is not to end single family zoning in Los Angeles. I didn't support SB 50. What has been the focus of my work since the beginning has been on building the affordable and deeply affordable housing that's going to take us out of our current housing crisis. And unless we build that housing, Sacramento is continuing to intervene here. And our current leadership, including David Rue, have simply failed to build this housing. I want to do that work in order to make sure our neighborhoods are growing in the way that we want them to. And we can only do that if leadership locally does the work. And that's exactly what I came here to do. Can I respond? Can I ask that? Can I answer? You know, uh Sorry, can I uh, can I intervene? I wasn't sure about the rules. I would love to be able to respond. Are we allowed to respond on everything, or what? What are your? No, are your... I'm just I'm letting you guys do it occasionally. I'm trying to get through these questions. You know, I, I think we talked about it earlier, and it, if it was like, you know, very personal, we talked about allowing a response. I do enjoy the conversation. Otherwise, it's just statements. Um, so I'm not want you guys to do it on everyone because I want to get get through. But if you feel super passionate, definitely raise your hand. Okay, I like to answer this question. I like to answer this question as well. And you know, and and um, and I didn't get to finish a lot of thoughts on my other questions as well. But um, you know, this is where my opponent says one thing and does another. You know, um, uh, because if you want to protect single family neighborhoods, this is your chance to oppose SB 1120 that will decimate single family neighborhoods. Um, if you are afraid of Sacramento intervening. Uh, read your own SOHA questionnaire and, and how she answered about uh, preventing Sacramento from coming in, uh, what her answer to that was. Because the point is, in the city of Los Angeles, there's study, study after study from the LA Conservancy, from the planning department, from numerous institutions that have shown that you do not have to demolish or, or take over single family neighborhoods. There's plenty of ways where you could develop in, in certain corridors. Actually, look at your own uh, Sherman Oaks vision plan that SOHA and the, and the neighborhood council came up with together, um, where it shows how we could do it without decimating single family neighborhoods. So it's Thank one thing to say one thing, but you. don't show it. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess I just wanted to quickly respond and to say <laughs> that unless we build the kind of affordable housing that we have been asked to build that we know we need because of the incredible uh, you know, how t rent burden that we're experiencing here and because of rising homelessness, which is directly linked to these, uh, to these rising uh, housing costs, we have to show a record of really doing that work. Over the last five years under the council members tenure, 93% of the housing built in this district has been luxury or market rate housing. Only 7% has been affordable. Those ratios are completely off. For me, and I want to encourage everybody here to take a look at my affordable housing plan, which talks about how we can change city policies to expedite and to make much cheaper the process of building affordable housing here in Los Angeles. We talked to so many nonprofit Thank developers that will formulate that plan. Thank you. Um, can, actually, can we have this continue this discussion because this is again a lack of understanding? Because the reason why, not just in my district, but the entire city of LA, 90% of all the housing built are luxury is because that's what the state laws allows it to do. And that's why I opposed SB 50. It's a free giveaway. I am trying to, I have been working and pushing to make sure that we inc increase our inclusionary zoning. This is why I opposed SB 50. Again, my opponent, I think out of convenience is now opposing SB 50 when there was a previous uh, uh, podcast where she said she supported it. It's not just about building housing, it's about building affordable and modern income housing and preserving existing affordable housing stock. That's gonna help prevent homelessness, that's gonna help prevent affo help affordability and prevent gentrification. Thank you. Um, this is a question for David. David, what you... Sorry, just to be clear, I, I did never support SB 50. So that's another, yet another lie. I just wanted to make sure that we, we got that on the record for everybody. And I've been very clear about what I think is good and what I think is bad. And I'm very, very happy to engage with residents on what you think is good policy for your neighborhood. That's something that I, I'll tell you where I come from and I wanna hear from you and I'm happy to have my mind changed. David, this is for you. What has been your biggest source of frustration as a city council member? And be honest here, be candid. I'll be candid with my closest 300 friends, right? <laughs> yeah. um, 
I think the biggest source of frustration, you know, the biggest source of frustration is also the biggest strength of our, um, of our, of, of our society as well. And it's the fact that, you know, no one person can make the decisions on their own. You know, an idea is only good as the paper that it's written in unless you could get it passed. And in the city of LA, you need eight votes. You need seven other council members to vote along with you. So no matter, I am trying to increase um, the fact that I am appalled how 92% of all housing in LA in the past five years are luxury. And that's why I co-authored the vacancy tax. Um, the fact is, I want to increase that. But we have lots of Wall Street Thank and you. developers trying to- uh, Thank you very much. Nithya, yeah, given what David yeah, said, here. you need that critical eight votes. I mean, that's such an important part of you know being successful. Yeah. How will you go about cultivating relationships with city council members? And 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 do you have any uh, strategic alliances already? Well, I'm hoping to build those alliances. If I do win, I don't have a lot of existing relationships with our current political system. Um, but I do see a lot of council members there who are in alignment with the kind of policies and the kind of approach that I've brought to the table. I also think it's incredibly important to have real civic engagement in order to get to the goals that we want to get to. Here in Los Angeles, a big barrier to building really necessary things like homeless housing, affordable housing, is that there's often public pushback. And I feel like going out and doing the kind of civic engagement that I've done telling people about our goals, bringing them into a vision for the future. That's the kind of community building work that we need to solve our incredibly difficult challenges going forward and something I'm so good at doing. Thank you. David, uh, Richard, do we have time for a couple more questions? You had said yes, to wrap it at 8.30, yeah. but I, wanna, I have a couple more. I can get them in really quick. Okay, let's do it. All right, great. I'm trying, I see some guys, some people submitted like four or five. I'm trying to get one from at least everybody. Um, this is a question for both of you. Do you support the public financing of city council campaigns? If so, which council persons support the public financing of city council campaigns? Let's just take it from the start. Do you support the public financing of city council campaigns? Yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think it's incredibly important. Do you guys support Medicare for all as proposed by Senator Elizabeth Warren? And why or why not? Explain your answer. Um, I, I do support Medicare for all. Uh, I know she changed some of her policies, uh, you know, at, at, during the campaign at some point, but I support Medicare for all. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to speak on more expansive policies, but yes. Yes I, do. yes, I do, because healthcare is a human right. Um, wow. Some of these are really hot-headed. <laughs> can I, can I, can I talk about the public financing? One thing is I support public financing completely, but um, it's part of the puzzle because it would not, uh, we would not be, have any mandate over um, federal laws, especially political action committees and independent expenditures, which would also be a problem. I think we got to reverse Citizens United where it says corporations are people because corporations are not people. So when we talk about public financing, I would hope in a utopian world that it would be a full public financing, including the federal government as well. Uh, if this is again for both of you, if Metro's analysis of the industry proposals for the Sepulveda corridor confirms that the monorail alternative built within the 405 freeway is technically viable and is the only alternative that fits within the Measure M budget, as some, of this, as some people have asserted, would you then support it? David, you go first. Um, uh, first and foremost, as I promised the Sherman Oaks neighborhood, I would try to push forward for underground. Um, and I don't want this the monorail, which I know is something that we've also talked about, I don't want the monorail to be the first option. I want that to be the secondary option. I want to make sure that we exhaust all options and exhaust all avenues of going underground, fully underground in Sherman Oaks before I even consider the monorail. But, you know, this is part of the negotiations. I don't want to, uh, um, like I said, that's not the first, that's not the first uh, option. It's the second or third option. Mm -hmm. And if you want to weigh in on that? Um, sure. I, you know, I, um, I, I would take, I, I'm excited to see what the study reveals. I will take the study very, very seriously. I know the Metro is very serious about their work. Of the four Metro options available right now, I've really, I like the HRT1 and HRT2. Um, I've expressed reservations a little bit about, uh, you know, trains that run in the middle of highways as someone who's used transit 
my entire life, public transit my entire life. I tend to find that public transit situated in the middle of a highway disincentivizes users sometimes. And I guess I would just say, I wanna make sure that any investment that we make in Valley Transit, which has been underinvested in for so long, really gets cars off the street. So I wanna pick the option that's really gonna be effective to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, I think it's been a really lively debate. I've enjoyed hearing both of your views and meeting you virtually, and I wish you well. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to question you. Okay, we have the closing statement. Who goes first? 90 seconds. Who goes first, Linda? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, Nithya went first in the beginning and won the toss. So should, does David then go first? Uh, should sure. We switch it up? Yes. David, why don't you do your closing statement? Thank you, Linda, and I thank you for doing this debate and for moderating the debate. And I want to thank Soha for hosting the debate tonight. I know I, we, I wish we had more time because there is so much more to discuss, but I'll close on this. There are less than two weeks until Election Day, and our city and our nation faces crises like we've never seen before. No matter who gets elected, from the, from the president to the city council on down, the next few years are going to be difficult and critical. We must take care of those who are most vulnerable among us and take steps to revive the economy. Our leaders need to be ready to take action on day one. There is already too much division and hate. We need leaders who could bring our community together and work with all of our neighborhoods. We don't have time to start from scratch, but for someone with no experience to learn on the job, I know what works and I'm ready to push through the emergency actions to end homelessness. I know the communities and I know how to make real progress on the issues that we face and I don't just talk about these issues, I get them done. From the developer ban, to stopping mansionization, to restoring our city's urban forestry division, I am on this job to serve you and to listen to you and every last member of the community. That's what, what it is to be a council member. It is not about ideology or radical agenda. It's about working with people, listening to them and making progress for our city. So I thank you all and I hope I earned your vote tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to thank this group again for having me. Um, just like in the primary, this was the liveliest of the forums that I attended. And I'm grateful to all of you for organizing it and to all of the attendees who came and listened in. Um, I just wanted to talk about what brought me to this race and what keeps me going in these last few days. I started running for this seat because I looked around this city and I saw a city that was quickly descending into crisis. Our homeless number, numbers of uh, people experiencing homelessness uh, going up year after year, rents rising, people being uh, evicted from their homes and getting displaced and our worsening air, worsening traffic. So many things that were interlocked that leave us as a city that's really struggling to the next step. COVID has made all of those things so much worse it's made these next few steps incredibly crucial for us. And I feel like nothing about our next steps is gonna be easy. It's going to require all of us coming together, putting that work together to help keep our communities fed and housed. And what I have demonstrated throughout this whole campaign is that we have the ability as a city to come together and unite for a vision of the future that is really transformed from the very bleak present that we're in right now. So I'm really excited to hopefully work on that transformative change with all of you over the next few years. Thank you so much. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to thank the uh, candidates, uh, Nithya and David. Uh, it was very informative and very lively. And I especially want to thank Linda Grasso, the editor-in-chief of the Ventura Boulevard Magazine for acting as moderator and uh, doing a much better job than I've seen on uh, national TV programs. <laughs> um, but it was fun. So our next meeting is the third Wednesday of November. Uh, City Attorney Michael Fuhr will be our speaker. We look forward to seeing everyone at that time. Stay safe.